Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I'm here with my co-host, Matt Scott. And today we're going to talk about the recent vehicle launches and our reviews of the new Overland four-wheel drives we have tested, including a modified Ranger, the new GMC AT4 Yukon, the new Titan, the new all-wheel drive Ford Transit, of course, the Defender, the new Ram 3.0 diesel, and a few others. And also this episode is presented by Garmin. We appreciate their support and their new Overlander GPS navigator. The Overlander is a bright seven inch color touchscreen with topography and spoken turn by turn directions for street maps. So you can easily navigate on and off road throughout North and South America. This unit comes preloaded with iOverlander POIs, which I have personally used out in the field, and also the Ultimate Public Campgrounds database as well. So you don't need to sell coverage to route to those favorite campsites or get to your next destination. The unit is also quite tough, uh, which I have also experienced using it in the Americas and also in Africa, and it is dust vibration and extreme temperature resistant. Aside from navigation, it also has built-in tools like pitch and roll gauges to help the driver navigate challenging terrain. Thank you again, Garmin, for your support of this podcast. And what are we going to talk about today, Matt? Talk about what we've been driving, I guess. We've, we've, I don't know, we've been driving a bunch of different stuff, new vehicles. Yeah, new Um, vehicles on the market. Yeah, we, we, I guess we're lucky enough to have early access to the Gladiator Mojave, which is pretty cool. I have been driving a Ram 1500 limited eco diesel and uh, you've been driving some new stuff too. Yeah. The, the new AT4 Yukon, we drove the new Nissan Titan. Of course, you and I both drove the Defender. I've had Which some t- definitely worth chatting about now that you can actually get one. That's right. And I've been spending a lot of time with the Ford Ranger that was completely modified by ARB. So what we want to do is start maybe once a quarter or so, we're going to do these little mashups where we talk about the new vehicles that we've evaluated for editorial and what are our pros and cons for each one. And these will be pretty short, little digestible podcasts on the new trucks on the market. So what did you think of the Mojave? You know, I I, I liked it. Um, You know, for those who haven't listened to previous podcasts, I was a really early adopter of the Gladiator platform. I was at the press launch for it. I want to say that was like February and March of 2019. Um, and, you know, we went and did a little off-road demonstration, did a road demonstration prior to that. And on the way back to the hotel that everything was based off of, I was on the phone with my local Jeep dealer. Do you have one? I want one. I got it. I had one of the first ones. I just hit 20,000 miles on that. Um Yesterday. It looks so good too. Yeah. You, and you pulled in on it today and it's like, that thing looks so good. Yeah. It's uh, you know, we have a dedicated podcast to that truck, but you know, that's our adventure vehicle. It's not something that I use as a daily driver. I'm not commuting on it. Um, you know, it's for Baja, it's for Moab, it's for, it's for remote places and not even a check engine light in 20,000 miles. So I'm a huge fan of the platform. And I think what the what the Mojave does is it really aligns the vehicle more um, with people who are less interested in technical um, terrain and more interested in, you know, desert terrain, wide open terrain. I mean, for somebody that's driving the vehicle daily, the suspension on the Mojave is definitely a lot it's really better. really nice. Um, you know, uh, it has a more substantial hood. The thing that I really liked about it, um, I loved the interior. They put a little bit more sporty steering wheel on it. Um, kind of some more perforated leather. Um, It's just nice orange accents. The one we had, I want to say they call it pumpkin orange. It's it's definitely pumpkin. It's, it's, it's really orange and I'm a, I'm I'm a fan of orange, Um, but it was a little bit maybe too orange, but yeah, it seemed like Jeep was sending us like the entire Skittles color (laughs) color way over a series of a couple of weeks. But I have to say that, you know, uh, the gladiator is great. This has a, 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 more substantial frame. I want to say they added some high strength steel and some critical areas. Um, it has, I guess what's cool is that it has a, a cast iron front axle. So it, it eschews the, the aluminum knuckles that are, I guess an issue if you're really, really moving in these things. Um, it's, it's cool. I, I guess for but the you money, delete, you delete the front locker, right? You do not get a front locker. You get a rear locker. 
you do not get the electronic sway bar disconnect and you get the, I want to say it's 2.7 to two low range rather than the Rubicon's stunningly low four to one, um, which I think we could both argue is almost too low. Well, if you have a manual transmission, the four to one is a great thing. Yeah. If you're doing a lot of very technical driving, obviously the four to one is a great thing. What I find the biggest problem with the four to one is if you're in mixed terrain, sand and mud in particular, also snow, if you need to reverse with any kind of speed, you're stuck with this very low wheel spin. So yeah, that's if point. you need to reverse out of a mud hole and you've got a four to one, you just can't get the tires spun up enough to clear out the mud. So I actually like, I prefer a 2.7 to one low range in the Wrangler for almost everything, but extreme rock crawling. Yeah. You know, I have to say what I, would I, if this was a vehicle that was available when I was buying it, I bought the gladiator Rubicon. Um, I, I, I probably wouldn't buy the Mojave. Um, it's about the same price as the gladiator Rubicon. Um, I'll be honest. I don't use the front locker that often, but it's nice to have. Um, the thing that I do use a lot is the electronic sway bar disconnect. You can use that anytime you're in four wheel drive high. It just drastically improves the ride quality of the, of the vehicle off road. That that's something that I wish that it had. Um, yeah, a lot less head toss. It allows yeah. the suspension to move more freely. I think it also in, greatly improves stability of the vehicle because you're keeping tires in yeah, contact with, the but terrain. for somebody um, that may not be doing more technical stuff that is going to put 35 inch tires on it, let's say um, I think, I think the, the Mojave is great. Um, you know, the, the remote reservoir shocks they used are fine. I mean, it's limited only mm-hmm. by the architecture of the vehicle. Solid axle can only do so much, um, you know, I thought that the off-road performance was probably still worse than in, in high speed than mine, but I'm on 37s and I have, you know, some fancy Kings, which are probably a better shock, but it doesn't have to meet the OE standards that, that obviously FCA or what is FCA called now? Yeah. Chrysler. Yeah. No, no, no. They have a new oh, name. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, look it up. It's interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd give it a seven out of 10. Um, great option. It's, it's, it's cool to see Jeep dialing into little areas, um, you know, with that V8 concept that they showed with the the 6.4. Um, I have to think that that engine in a Mojave would be a lot of fun. Um, and I think that's what's coming. I think that Jeep is now getting some pressure, some competitive pressure, but they've already got such a foundation to work from that they can salt in these things that they never really, we've always wanted V8s. We've always wanted diesels. Yeah. And before they they didn't have a reason to, because this was the only option. Now they've got some competition and they're just now taking, opening up the catalog and saying, all right, we're going to throw in a V8 and a bunch of people get excited and they buy a Wrangler instead of something else. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the three, I don't know. Let me me start over here. The three, six that is in the gladiator is fine. It's reliable. It's a proven motor. It's cheap to service. I think for international travel, um, that's probably the one to go with um, the diesel, which we're going to be driving. We get it. What in two weeks, in two weeks, we get the diesel gladiator. Um, I'm sure it's going to drive great. You know, I do still have questions on it in terms of long-term reliability. Um, the um, engine just prior to that, which is the same basic structure. I had friends that had that in the 1500 with um, limited success, but yeah, I, I, I'm just excited to see the Gladiator platform grow. It's it's so good for overlanding. And, um, it's a perfect hit. They just they literally nailed a perfect hit. Again, so. just hit 20,000 miles on my personal one. I paid full price for it. I didn't get any discounts or anything. I was that enthusiastic about it. And I have vehicle ADD, as some of our readers will know. Still have it, not planning on selling it. Yeah. I don't know. That says something when you hold on to a vehicle for more than a year. I, I just renewed the <laughs> registration. Wow. <laughs> yeah, commitment. You're, you're going to be okay. Yeah. I might, might put a ring on it, <laughs> but no, oh, nice. it's good. Defender. Yeah, I, I like, I did like the Mojave. I think for me, I think it's trying to be something that it's not. And for people who want a Mojave that is a little bit more go fast, it works, but you're always going to be dealing with the weight of a solid front axle. Yes. It will never respond as effectively as independent at high speed. There's a reason why 
race trucks have independent suspension. And it's just, you have to know that you have to understand that and, and say, okay, I really want solid axle. I really want a gladiator, but to think that it's going to perform like a Raptor, it's just not physics. I, don't I, allow I it. think, I think that there are advantages to a solid axle, um, for aggressive desert driving. Um, I never have to worry about my ground clearance changing, right? Um, I, I don't have a differential that is rapidly, uh, yeah, with every you know, impact yeah. coming up and down and, and, and getting closer to the, to the dirt. That's nice. Um, they're way easier to lift. Again, I have a factory two inch lift on mine with 37 inch tires. So like, let's say a uh, Ranger or a Tacoma, there is virtually no way to fit 37s on that vehicle without substantially Major, yeah. modifying it. Um, and then you're talking heim joints and you're talking all this kind of stuff and they're not going to drive good. They're not going to have the reliability and durability that you need. Um, you know, yeah. If you want 37s on a pickup by a gladiator, by a gladiator. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean like, I don't know. I, I would put money that even with a camper, my gladiator is way more proficient in high speed stuff. than let's say a ZR one, cause they have to deal with those little or not ZR one. That's the Corvette, the ZR <laughs> Two, you know, they have to deal with 31 inch tires. Yeah. And maybe if you're lucky, you can fit 33s. Yeah. 37s do you, forgive a lot of sins. That's exactly. for sure. So I also had the diesel Wrangler for a little bit. So this is the first time for us to really talk about the diesel drivetrain in a Wrangler. I liked it a lot. Yeah. The, the consideration obviously is international travel where you don't have access to ultra low sulfur diesel, but for driving around in Prescott, we're at 5,200 feet. I'm, I'm, I have a turbocharged motor yes. with really good torque. I towed a brooder trailer with it. And this, that little Jeep, I was getting 25, 26 miles a gallon legitimate. And I don't drive. Yeah. You're gently. just driving it. I'm just yeah. driving and getting that kind of gas mileage. It's, I mean, this is the thing I love about the diesel Wrangler. It's the vehicle we always wanted. We always wanted solid axle Wrangler with lockers and sway bar disconnects and can fit a 33 inch tire from the factory yes. and has a diesel motor. We've always asked for this vehicle. We now can buy it. And to me, even if I don't buy one personally, I think it is so cool that it's finally available. You know, I think what, I think what Jeep does really, really well is, um, you know, aside from the V eights and the diesels, which we're now getting, they listen to their customers and I've they really always appreciated do. that. Um, but yeah, what, what better? That's the, it's the dream team. It really is. I mean, the fact that in 2020 we can get a diesel solid axle Wrangler with lockers, sway bar disconnects and 33s. And you can take the roof off and the doors off it's and so, pull the windshield down. I, in like I think two we're, minutes. we're kind of in the golden age of overland trucks. I mean, certainly in the early nineties that also existed with 80 series and, and diesel G wagons and, and all yeah. of that. But Right now, it's it's a, the golden age again, just a little different. I, I I don't even think that there's a comparison. I mean, I know most Americans still look at you know diesel Land Cruisers and Hiluxes and this as you know they, they've kind of there's there's a folklore to them and a bit of a myth going on. They're not that great. I mean, I I have a I went out and I as soon as I could I got the turbo diesel eighty when you could import it and probably going to be for sale soon because. It, the Gladiator is just so much better. The Gladiator gets technology better has, gas mileage than yeah, the, the diesel. Yeah, the technology has improved. At the time, those vehicles were the hallmark of reliability, but manufacturers have figured a lot of this reli- reliability stuff out Electronics now. have improved. Yeah, not just Toyota is reliable anymore. Most manufacturers are very reliable now, exactly. and that's that's pretty exciting to see. All right, and then you had a diesel Ram 1500. Yeah, the diesel Ram 1500 limited um which i loved it to be honest um i've always loved that that new 1500 platform it rides spectacularly um did it have the airbag suspension that one had air suspension so you could raise it or lower it um the interior is like I'm going to say this, like it is on par with a lot of the Land Rover, Range Rover products um, where they're a little bit more minimalist. The, the limited package is um, more embellished. You know, they have some weird like Western themed stitching going on, but I'm kind of like, like, 
that's a little bit tacky. Um, but the, the materials on the inside, the leather is just, it's a really, really, really nice place to be. Um, it handles pretty good. You know, the, the diesel in that vehicle wasn't, um, the, the focal point would be the economy, the fuel economy that I could return. Sure. Um, it wasn't a powerful engine. Um, so you missed the Hemi in that particular application. (sighs) You know, Laura's dad has a, uh, basically identical truck. He has the limited, but he has the, the five, seven. And I think the five, seven is more interesting to drive. Um, I think the diesel obviously gets, gets phenomenal gas mileage. Um, but I, I think what I walked away from is that as a technology demonstrator to see the diesel, to see the air suspension, to see the quality that that company is able to achieve. Um, it, it leaves me really, really excited for this grand Wagoneer that they've been teasing um, soon it's coming soon. soon. And boy, I, I have to say that. Yeah. Eight, eight out of 10 for, for me, for that limited, um, you know, it's not, listen guys, we're not talking here about, uh, about the, I know overlanders kind of like the more basic things, um, cloth interior, whatever, cause the, it, it more of a purposeful vehicle, but I, I'm just talking about what that company can do. And it's, it was, it was great. A nice daily driver. I mean, it was, you know, it was a black truck in the summer in Arizona. So the AC wasn't super great, but you press a button and the seats start blowing cool air at <laughs> your derriere. And yeah. it was, I, I really liked it. It, yeah, it, it was, was a lot, nice, nice looking truck. It too. was a lot better than the Nissan Titan that I drove immediately yeah. after. It was like, it was going from something very significant to Huh. Something with some challenges. People pay for this yeah. and they weren't that different in price point, which was the, the interesting thing for me. Yeah. So, um, very valid. And then another long-termer that we've had, we got the ARB outfitted Ford Ranger yeah. and which looks great. It does. It looks great. And they've addressed essentially all the things that I didn't like about the stock Ranger, principally the rear suspension and rear shock tuning, um, with the new old main emu on there, the multi-leaf pack, it's a nice little truck. I drive it almost every day and I have, I've kind of fallen for it. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed that it's got a Ford Motorsports tuner on it Oh yeah, and it starts pushing three, I think it's 317 horsepower now. And out of a force, I would have never thought to buy and that a four cylinder transmission. It's so good. Pe- people seem to fail to realize that. Yes cars have become more powerful, but it's really the gearbox technology that is making these things so drivable. I had that gearbox in my Raptor and people, Oh, well, that's going to break. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. It didn't break. It's been great. And having 10 different ratios to choose from makes that 317 horsepower. I mean, that thing's, that thing's pretty quick. It, it's really quick. It's noticeable. And again, we're at 5,200 feet and I'm getting great performance out of the truck. So I, there's a lot of things that I like about the vehicle, principally the suspension. Um, ARB has done a nice job of, cause they're starting to partner with Ford more. They did a nice job with the front bumper. It's really going to be fun to see what that ARB partnership results in, particularly around the new Bronco. So the fact that ARB is working that closely with Ford. I think we're going to see a lot more Ford factory solutions that feature ARB products. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good thing. Good yeah, thing for the I, end consumer. I think so. All right. Let's do a little update on Defender. Yeah. So Defender is now available. I actually saw one at the dealer. I want to say the initial, the initial run of them has sold out. Um, and obviously the world, um, when we drove the Defender in Namibia in February or March, the February, world, is, yeah, the world, the world has drastically changed. So, um, it's, it's fascinating just, just to see them out there. Um, when we were up in Colorado last month, there was three or four of them running around in Telluride and, um, I'm, I'm pretty excited. I keep going online and I keep doing the, you know, the vehicle configurator. And I love the fact that they actually went to production with the built-in air compressor. They went to production with the, the shower system. Um, there's a lot of really cool things about that car. And we've got a couple of them that are going to be showing up here in the next few weeks. It'll will this podcast will come out after we're talking about this, but we're doing a, a television show with yeah. with the Defender. So I'm pretty excited 
to see how it is to use that vehicle for a week in the field uh, when I've got it, the keys all to my, all to myself. So my favorite thing on the defender, I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't, I, I think the styling of it on the exterior is very forgettable. Like they use a lot of just these kind of gentle curves and there's nothing. I, I guess I still look at an off-road vehicle and I want, I want a little bit of aggression, but I love the interior. Really um, good. It's so practical. Like, I find when I get into a car these days, you know, I have this big cell phone because phones are not getting smaller. I have this wallet that has all this junk in it. I have my keys. I have this, I have that. There's places to just like download all your crap into in the defender. Like there's a really nice pocket next to the, uh, for left-hand drive vehicles, or we'll talk about left-hand drive vehicles on the left-hand side, there's a little pocket. You can put your stuff. There's, you know, the, the dash is essentially hollow on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a really practical vehicle. I think it's one of the best interiors currently available for Hands down. vehicle-based travel. No question. And it's also class-leading ride quality. We did do a full podcast on the Defender. Uh, Matt and I certainly have our reservations around the front end styling. But I think all of that's going to be addressed with the aftermarket. Bumpers are going to come out. Things, it's already starting to. Things are going to make that front end not forgettable. It's going to make it memorable and it's going to make the vehicle even more suitable for backcountry travel. What we really need to see with Defender is these things out in the field proving to be reliable over a period of time. And then I think you're going to start to see sales increase within the overland crowd. I mean, we didn't really have any major issues um, with places we took them um, and we were in pre-production vehicles. Obviously Land Rover's watching those things like a hawk, but um, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting. I, I believe I said in my editorial, like if it's reliable, it will be one of the greats. Um, and they've done everything that they can. I think to, they have. They ensure. really, they really put a lot of thought and passion into that vehicle. You can see it. All right. Well, then now BT4, the def- four. Yeah. I guess so, so this podcast will come out after the embargo, which is good. So, I've had access to the AT4 Yukon. GMC has decided to permeate the AT4 option model across all of their four-wheel drive vehicles. So anything with an AT4 badge is kind of like a trail-rated Jeep. So it gets larger diameter tires. It gets a more aggressive tread pattern. It gets some underbody skid plating. It They do some work to improve the approach and sometimes the departure angle. It gets uh, some unique styling as well. And then they also usually include some kind of a driver selectable off-road mode cool. as well. This this Yukon had four-stage airbag suspension. It had excellent ride quality. I think that that's one of the huge benefits of the airbag systems. And then we also get a much bigger payload. This is a seven or eight passenger vehicle. So because it can haul so many people, it has to have a and really high that with gear. Yeah. It has to have a really high payload. It drove nicely. And the, and the five, three was a little underwhelming on the power. The AT four is only available with a five, three, unfortunately, because of the front end bumper architecture, you're not going to see the diesel in the AT four, but the five, three is totally adequate. It's kind of like the three, six, it works, it works and um, really nice, comfortable vehicle. I did the whole uh, Mogi on Rim Road with it. We did some trails in Sedona with it. A uh, very comfortable vehicle. I really liked the suspension. This was a pre production unit. I did not see the effectiveness out of the traction control that I would have expected. So maybe that will be resolved for production. I think we need to get a hold of a production unit before we have final say on that. But I was a little disappointed in the traction control performance yeah. out of it. And I, and I guess this is kind of. You know, I know GM has had the um, ZR2. Yep. Um, but this is really their first kind of more general foray into actually offering products, maybe more targeted towards an adventure or off-road enthusiast because they really haven't. They've not had it. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I guess I've always kind of thought uh, they have the Corvette and they have the Camaro, but um, that was where most of their excitement went. Um it's just, it's cool to see more options for people. Like you said, we're pretty much in the golden age of, of overland. Now they have the bison, which is one of the best mid, mid size yeah, trucks that yeah. you can buy today. Diesel front and rear lockers, great suspension. It's certainly one of the high marks uh, within the GM lineup. But I, what I'm excited to see is this attention from the manufacturers towards off-road performance. It's one of the fastest growing and, and most lucrative segments yes. of automotive today. 
because they see so much pressure from EVs. So they're going to make lifestyle vehicles that still have pistons in them. And yep. that's going to be off-road for a while. And I think that that's where we're going to see a lot of the off-road innovation. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're fun to tinker with. They're, they're just fascinating vehicles. So, so do we want to talk a little bit about the Nissan? Yeah, I guess maybe just, can. maybe just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, listen, there's nothing wrong with the vehicle. Um, Nissan Titan is what we're Nissan talking. Titan SL. It, it's like the Costco of luxury pickup trucks is, is how I'm politely trying to say it. Um, you know, looking at what they were actually selling for, um, because pickup trucks are confusing in that regard. You can have pickup trucks that have a $70,000 sticker, but they're actually selling for mid fifties. So, you know, the the problem is that what they're actually selling for is you're comparing it to F-150 King Ranches. You're comparing it to F-250 Lariats. Um, you're comparing it to 2,500s. You're comparing it to very well equipped um, Ram 1500s. And it just doesn't play ball with them. Unfortunately, they have that new, I want to call it, they say they call it the endurance V8. The motor was fine. The transmission um, just didn't seem to be very refined, um, but it, it actually like handled pretty well. I think. Yeah. My experience was if you drove that vehicle conservatively, it felt it did not feel like it performed well. If you started to really push it, yeah. I started to, like the motor needs to rev. The transmission needs to know that you're alive and you're getting after it. Off-road, the vehicle just struggled. It's really not an off-road vehicle. They don't really have a package that's suitable yeah. for that. There are other options. Well, they do have the Pro 4X they do. model, but I, 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 I guess there's so many good American pickup trucks and then there's the Tundra, which is as equally outdated. I, I don't know. I, yeah, you can Nissan, they try so hard and the, and the people at Nissan are such good people, yeah. but they, they need, they need to interject some performance into these lineups yes. in order to remain relevant as EVs start to take control. So if you don't play ball with demonstrable performance, real functional components of these vehicles that make them exciting or make them play ball with the, the others in the space. I think that Nissan will continue to struggle. Yeah. You know, I guess I've always seen Nissan as kind of, I don't want to call it a budget brand, but I mean, good quality vehicles, lots of reliability, but they're just not competitive on price is, is why I would have a hard time recommending that vehicle. I'm sure it's reliable. Um, the build quality was just fine. It just, they just need to interject some excitement into it, or they need to adjust the pricing that you see on MSRP. And that will bring the model into the interest of the consumer. Yeah. Buyer, like so. the frontier is a great option because totally. they're, they're affordable. You can get into them totally affordably. Legit, right. So my favorite Nissan for sure is yeah, the frontier. Take a look at the frontier, but so these are some of the new vehicles. We have a power wagon coming. We've got a diesel gladiator coming. I'm testing even an all wheel drive Ford transit right now. So there's going to be a lot more to talk about in the next episode. And we thank you all for listening and we will talk to you next time.